funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brianna Venosi. More than a year after the state ordered all public and private schools to close in an effort to contain the spread of the coronavirus, just 16 school districts remain all remote. That's about 53,000 students who are still learning and working virtually from home. Governor Murphy's been pushing to get every student back in the classroom for in-person learning before the end of the academic year. There's just a few weeks left as the number of new statewide COVID cases continue on a downward trend. 1,300 positive tests and 34 more deaths reported today. Out of the districts that have yet to reopen, five are public, including Patterson, which is one of the largest in the state. The district and teachers union remain locked in a dispute over the readiness of buildings to safely welcome back students and staff. It's become a familiar pattern, one that's played out all across New Jersey this year with families caught in the middle. Leigh Mishkin reports. Patterson teacher and mom of two, Euasia Cohen, had to do our interview from her car so it wouldn't conflict with her kids' school inside. An example of the challenges parents still face with virtual learning, 14 months after schools closed their doors. Our whole slogan throughout the house is like, my mic is on, my mic is on. The single mom says she's still only able to work one day a week so she can help her kids deal with daily technology issues. My kids are I won't say behind, but it has delayed them in completing assignments, you know, getting their full like lesson that they need throughout the day because Wi-Fi conk out or, you know, um, the, the computer just shut off. And that'll remain their daily reality. As of today, Patterson School District has no reopening date. We have been guided through the entire pandemic by the science and the data, and we will continue to be. As the roughly 25,000 students in Patterson continue to learn virtually, the superintendent says the district has spent close to $20 million preparing schools to reopen. At a special board of education meeting last week, the district said after completing safety walkthroughs of the district's roughly 50 buildings, they found most schools had met the requirements to reopen. Three foot social distancing is in place, temperature scanners, hand sanitizer and masks readily available, and in classrooms with no windows, purifiers and air scrubbers will be installed before the end of June. As you can see, uh, a lot of work went into the preparation um, of reopening schools. It's unfathomable that you could still have windows not, op not operational in so many locations after spending all that money. Patterson Education Association, which represents 3,000 teachers, came to a drastically different conclusion after union representatives did the same walkthrough. They say just 10 schools were ready to reopen, 26 were not ready, and 20 buildings were unsafe. One major issue, indoor air quality. We want to be back in school, so, so I, I want to first and foremost start by saying this conversation is not to manipulate the community into thinking that the association wants to remain closed. We certainly understand that there are many issues that cannot be remediated between now and September. But the idea that we could walk through schools and find windows bolted shut. There's a disconnect and apparently a breakdown in communication. There's obviously disagreement. But I think that we have to move forward. We have to get to a place where we're on common ground. The Patterson School District spokesperson told us in a statement, Superintendent Schaefer continues to be ready to meet with the PEA's leadership. And she has scheduled a meeting with them, which they opt not to attend. I made the decision to not attend the meeting until we have copies of all the things that we've asked for. The union is calling for the district to fix the remaining problems in the next 60 days and to do a soft opening for summer school. 
not in time for the end of this school year. My daughter had her high hopes of going inside, you know, Rosa Parks High School, physically meeting her dance um, mates and meeting her dance teacher. We have to put both things on the table and figure out how we're going to make it all right. The district and union continue to spar, but Eurasia Cohen hopes they come to an agreement soon, since it's the parents and students who are caught in the middle. I'm Leah Mishkin for NJ Spotlight News. Well, it could be another sign of the dropping demand for vaccines. Essex County is closing three vaccination sites because not enough people are showing up. Locations set up at the former Sears store in Livingston Mall, the Donald Payne School in Newark, and another location in West Caldwell will all shut down. The scenes there are a far cry from just months ago when lines snaked back and forth and even down the street. Just nine residents had appointments for their first shot in Livingston on Monday. As of this morning, more than 3.3 million residents are now fully vaccinated. The Murphy administration says it's nearly three quarters of the way to meeting a goal of vaccinating 4.7 million adults by the end of June. But in mid-April, the state was administering roughly 120,000 shots a day. That's now dropped to well under 80,000 a day. Governor Murphy today said the closures are also part of a shift toward a more strategic focus on populations by sending supply to local pharmacies, mobile units, and pop-up sites. Meantime, kids still aren't eligible for a COVID-19 vaccination, though an FDA authorization for Pfizer's shot to be used in 12 to 15-year-olds could come as early as next week. Until then, public health experts anticipate seeing a rise in cases among youth as schools reopen and activities resume. The medical world is still learning about how the virus reacts in children versus adults. Many don't experience severe illness from COVID-19, but the virus can have a serious and long impact on their health. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports on the state's first and only pediatric clinic for long-haul COVID kids. It's scary, it's sad, you question, and you, you, un, you don't understand the whole concept of everything that's occurring. Carla McGreeny's 15-year-old son, Jaden, got COVID back in January, he spent six desperate days in the hospital at St. Barnabas. After a harrowing battle with the virus, Jaden went home, and his family figured he'd beaten COVID, recovered. It was like a sigh of relief. Like, my son is home, he's fine, he's healthy, he's never had any health issues. Um, but then we started picking up, I think, on little things. Carla says symptoms snowballed. Her straight-A student hit a wall. I think it was the brain fog, the forgetfulness, confusion. Um, and the biggest thing was definitely his grades with school. That was like my biggest like aha moment. Parents call confused and very, very worried. Nurse navigator Lauren Ferrand works at New Jersey's only clinic at St. Barnabas that helps families cope with pediatric long COVID, where kids who seemed fine suddenly find themselves fighting the delayed after effects of their COVID infection. We've heard many times, well, maybe kids don't get as sick or they get sick, but they recover and they're fine. And then you have a parent who sees their child, knows their child the best, and they're saying, well, my child's not fine. What's going on? We thought, oh my gosh, uh, you know, there is definitely a need to create awareness in, in, in the community around us. Director Dr. Uzma Hassan says the clinic's treating and tracking about 90 young long COVID patients. She says even kids who initially experienced mild or even no COVID symptoms can suffer a sudden onset of long COVID. One case involves a young athletic dance student. She's struggling to get back on her feet. She's having episodes of dizziness where she feels like she's going to fall. She's having heart palpitations. She is anxious, depressed out of her mind and feels like she is word finding difficulty. Kids show the same symptoms that impact adult long COVID patients, among them mental fog and physical impairment of heart and lungs. The clinic does a careful examination and can direct young patients to more than a dozen specialists like pulmonologist Stephanie Zandia. She's seen star athletes benched short of breath. They're like, I could run two miles, no problem, but now I have to stop after like five minutes and catch my breath. Kids who got very sick initially from COVID may have scarred heart muscle, according to cardiologist Rajiv Verma with serious implications. High school, uh, college athletes, and the consequences of whether we will have to limit their activities and monitor them there. So how long is long COVID in kids? Doctors say they don't really know. It could last for weeks, but with kids, there is some good news. Although you're experiencing symptoms now that are frightening and discouraging, 
it's not like this always, and it won't be like this always. Kids have this remarkable ability to recover. They're very resilient. So far, Jersey's logged 18,000 COVID cases among kids up to age four and almost 87,000 in kids aged five to 17. Severe cases of COVID-related MSIC, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, top 100 in New Jersey, but no kids are now hospitalized and no children died of the syndrome. Doctors at RWJ Barnabas, an underwriter of NJ Spotlight News expect more cases. Full vaccination for children is not going to be for, for several, several months. Schools are opening up, activities are opening up, and we think there's going to be some more infections, unfortunately. Vaccinations have helped some adult long COVID patients recover. Carla hopes to get Jaden and all of her kids vaccinated. I think we have a, a road ahead of us, and I want him to get back to him 100%. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Well, right around this time of year, you'll notice a flood of campaign mailers showing up at your house, the usual lawn signs, and more candidate ads online. But you likely haven't seen much of it from Governor Murphy. His campaign is sitting on a war chest worth millions to spend in the upcoming primary election, but without an opponent to target. Senior correspondent David Cruz looks at the power of the incumbency when running a campaign. A Democrat hasn't been re-elected governor in New Jersey in over 40 years. That was Brendan Byrne back in 1977. But with six months to go before Election Day, Governor Phil Murphy seems poised to break that streak. A new poll out today from Monmouth University shows Murphy with strong support from voters. 57% approving of the job he's doing as opposed to 35% who don't. That's down from his 71-21 split from last year. Among Democrats, though, Murphy's at 77 percent. Independents, 39 percent. Republicans, 15. The governor, who took office as a relative unknown in the state, has become the face of the COVID-19 response and a ubiquitous presence on TV through his daily briefings. And it seems to be working for him. Every sitting governor that runs for re-election has the power of incumbency, the advantage of incumbency to run. But Murphy is taking this to a new level with these coronavirus briefings. And that doesn't even include the free media that accompanies the visits to vaccine sites and various national press appearances. This is a perfect storm for Murphy. He gets to lead the parade uh, into recovery. With $7 million in a primary campaign fund, you should expect more Murphy, much more Murphy, in the month of May. Yes, um, and I expect that we will start seeing some significant advertising buys uh, on behalf of the governor promoting uh, his accomplishments. And he has a, a record. He sucks. <laughs> he well, sucks. Why does he suck? He just sucks. But it ain't all touchdowns and home runs, to use a couple of Murphy sports metaphors. Aside from the random harumphing pedestrian, small business owners have blasted the governor's lockdown orders, which have, according to some figures, resulted in a third of them going under for good. Still, with this week's announcement that many restrictions are being lifted and capacities expanded, even that albatross appears to have loosened its grip. The pandemic situation especially wasn't that bad. It could have been a little better um, in terms of uh, hospitality and what we're allowed to do in certain areas. Uh, but I think he's, you know, uh, overall, he did an average job, you know. Then there were those debacles at the MVC, the unemployment office, and the long-term care facilities. Even that, it seems, has failed to sink the good ship Murphy. There was no textbook for this, and everybody knows that. Everybody knows that we have not been through anything like this in 100 years. And so, uh, yes, there were going to be bumps in the road, and we all felt those bumps in the road. If we get to September and kids are not back in school, I would expect you know Governor Murphy to take that on the chin. But that's not where we look like we're going at this point. Republican Jack Cittarelli is hoping to weigh Murphy down with baggage that voters, at this point anyway, don't seem to want to put on the governor. But six months is an eternity in politics, and global pandemics don't care about elections or polls. So the governor shouldn't be jumping for joy or spiking any footballs just yet. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News.
A plan to close the Union County Jail is hitting some roadblocks. A group of advocates are calling on the U.S. Justice Department to investigate the agreement, which was touted as a way to cut costs, about $100 million over five years, by sending prisoners from the Union County Jail in Elizabeth to the nearby Essex County Correctional Facility in Newark. Activists from the National United Youth Council claim the plan impacts legal rights, safety, health, and well-being of inmates, pointing to COVID-19 outbreaks within the Newark facility and allegations of corrections officer abuse and corruption. Union County leaders dispute those claims. A spokesperson says the Newark prison received a 100 percent compliance rate from the Department of Corrections for more than a decade. The dispute comes on the heels of an announcement by Essex County to end its relationship with ICE by housing detainees. In the wake of fatal police shootings across the country involving black and brown youth, New Jersey high school students are taking a stand, requesting big changes inside their schools. They say teens in historically over-policed communities need more access to mental health counselors not cops. In recent years, districts have deployed school resource officers, retired members of police departments, to act as mentors and keep school buildings safe. As Melissa Rose Cooper reports, student advocates say it's time for the state to make a new investment. What do we want? Police free schools! What do we want? Police free schools! These high school students and local youth leaders gathering at Newark's Lincoln Park to make their voices heard. Money for school, not police! Money for school, not police! They say many of New Jersey's schools, predominantly ones where black and brown children attend, invest way too much money in policing and not enough in counseling and other much-needed health-related resources. In my school, we have around six to seven security guards, while we have only three guidance counselors and one nurse. And this is stressing all of the students out because it feels like we're constantly being targeted and we're constantly being afraid that if we mess up, there's going to be a very big repercussion. So they're calling on state lawmakers to redirect hundreds of thousands of dollars in funds they say are used for security measures that target and criminalize students of color. New Jersey has the highest black to white incarceration rate and the fourth highest um, Latino incarceration rate in the nation. So we need to move away from incarcerating youth and um, supporting young people in the communities where they come from. It's a sentiment these youth advocates say would not only benefit students here in New Jersey, but also across the country, especially in light of recent events where black and brown youth like 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant of Ohio and 13-year-old Adam Toledo of Chicago died at the hands of police. For example, Adam Toledo, he grew up in a school where there was not even an art class in there, and he loved doing art. And one of the words that his teacher gave was, if only we had an art class for him. And it's upsetting that resources like that are not given to students in, in communities where disproportionately they are black and brown. Students at this rally say having police and security guards at schools only makes the situation worse. They say they're fed up, and it's time for change. According to the New Jersey Association of School Resources Officers website, officers are properly trained and are present to, quote, protect students, school faculty, and staff, and the schools they attend. But not everyone sees their presence that way. I've been bullied a lot, but security guards have never done anything to stop it. It made me feel like I was deserving of what happened to me. Criminal, and now, a person who has committed a crime similar to lawbreaker, offender, wrongdoer, villain, felon. That was what the metal detector in my high school said about me. It labeled and defined me before I could even introduce myself. Students say they just want to feel a sense of normalcy and heightened security measures at schools isn't the answer. We want to be able to take the metal detectors out of our school so we don't feel like criminals just for walking into school to receive an education. Advocates continue to urge lawmakers to put more funding into health and well-being resources for youth. They say they'll continue to demand change until it happens. Hey, hey, ho, ho, police and schools have got to go. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper.
Turning now to the gains being reported in the private jobs market and whether the progress hit expectations. Rhonda Schaffler has details and tonight's top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, private companies added hundreds of thousands of new workers in April. New Jersey-based ADP says 742,000 positions were added. It's a strong showing, but slightly under economists' forecasts. Nearly a third of those jobs were in the hospitality industry. More than a year into the pandemic, working conditions and worker attitudes have changed dramatically based on the findings from ADP's Research Institute's latest report. Workers have more fears about job insecurity, and that's prompted more than 75% of the respondents to take on extra tasks or work longer hours. Some were compensated for that extra work, but many were not. Unpaid overtime has jumped sharply, according to Neela Richardson, the chief economist at ADP. And the incidence of working for free unpaid work grew, especially here in North America. It doubled in the, in the course of a short one year period. So a mixed kind of result in terms of pay and performance over the last year. Meantime, younger workers, Gen Z, suffered the greatest job loss in the past year. There's a big push in New Jersey now for energy efficiency, and it could lead to lower utility bills. The state's gas and electric utilities are spending a total of $1.6 million over the next three years to encourage their customers to reduce energy use. Each utility is offering different incentives, such as a rebate for installing an energy efficient appliance. Find out more by reading my colleague Tom Johnson's article on njspotlightnews.org. A federal judge today overturned a national ban on evictions, according to reports. The ban issued by the CDC was designed to protect those who have fallen behind on their rent. But even with this ruling against the federal ban, there are also local and state laws on the books banning evictions during a public health emergency. New Jersey has had such a ban in place for over a year now. Now here's a look at how the Wall Street trading day ended up. I'm Rob DeShapler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by SJ Magazine, the heart and soul of South Jersey. Online at sjmagazine.net. Well, finally tonight, we bring you the story of an endangered bird's perseverance and the work of one local man to help it survive. The tiny red knot weighs just 4.7 ounces, yet manages to migrate 10,000 miles every year from South America to the Canadian Arctic, making a crucial stopover right here in Jersey on the Delaware Bay. The shorebird relies on a feast of horseshoe crab eggs found along our coastline to stay alive. And for the last 25 years, wildlife biologist Larry Niles has made it his mission to make sure neither goes extinct. He joins me now. Larry, I know you started this work in the late 90s. How did you get flagged to the issue? The issue first arose in the early 90s when uh, suddenly fish, fishers from New England were coming down to New Jersey and taking crabs for bait. And uh, that quickly went from about 100,000 crabs to 2.5 million each year. Wow. And then it's basically been a battle ever since then to stop people from killing crabs. Is that overfishing the biggest threat to the existence of this red knot bird? Uh, now the fishing is uh, well regulated in terms of uh, bait harvest, the harvest by fishers. But it's the combined threats, like there's, they're still killing crabs for bait, about 700,000 a year. Uh, but they're also killing crabs for their blood. And, you know, they, it's a process where they could not kill crabs if they took less blood and took better care. Because see, the, the best use of crabs is to let them live and, and blossom within the ecosystem that, you know, Delaware Bay, because what we found over the years uh, is that the birds depend on these eggs. But what we also found is fish, almost all the species of fish in the bay are 
eating eggs. So that when the horseshoe crabs went down, all the fish went down too. And see, that's what the problem is with horseshoe crabs is that they're not being recognized for that value that you can't put a a dollar figure to because it expresses itself at the higher levels of the food chain, like birds and fish. Do you see these birds coming back, not just from the brink, but really being here, you know, surviving for the long haul? See, I feel optimistic about it because I think we can make the transition and uh, we can restore these ecosystems. I think Delaware Bay is really a perfect example because you have the bones of restoration. You know, all the land is still intact, but you just need to do a better job at management. So it's the same story in education and every, it's like a generational effort that just, you know, everybody's got to do their part. Larry Niles, great to talk to you today. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Brianna. For more on Larry Niles' decades of work to protect the Red Knots, check out John Hurdle's piece on njspotlightnews.org. And ahead of this Mother's Day weekend, we look at the pandemic pressures on mom and the toll this health crisis has taken on their careers, parenting, and, of course, mental health. Senior correspondent David Cruz takes a deeper look at moms as unsung heroes of the pandemic for this week's chat box, live Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. Send your questions ahead of time or tweet us using the hashtag chatboxNJPBS. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire news team, thanks for watching. Have a great night. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.